Hi folks, uh, we're in a, uh, a FaceTime chat uh, situation again, and um, I'd like to uh, I'd like to do something fun with you guys this evening. Um, I'd like to talk to you for a little while about the sources of inspiration that motivate our motion picture lighting. Um, it's not uncommon for students in a lighting one um, uh, class to ask a fairly simple, straightforward question of me. Um, and that is, how do you know where to begin your lighting? And um, it's, it's a legitimate question. It's a really good question. Um, because until you've been educated in, in some of the things that you know, that we're doing on set. I mean, you know that we're setting shots and we have our camera and everything. We have our actors and our, and our set before us. Um, but how do you begin the thought process of, you know, where does the light want to come from and, and what quality do I want it to have? And so um, when that question inevitably comes up, uh, I welcome it. And, and then I get to do with my students something that I really enjoy, which is to introduce you, in some cases for the first time, uh, but not always, but in many cases for the first time, introduce you folks to the source of our inspiration. And to do that, um, whenever I have a, uh, a brick and mortar classroom and I have a, a group of students, um, I generally. Uh, start the conversation with a field trip. And that field trip um, likes to go to um, the local museum. Uh, when I was in Los Angeles, the, uh, the uh, Norton Simon Museum in Pasadena was a favorite uh, destination for the field trip. Uh, or um, in uh, Westwood, Los Angeles, uh, the Getty Museum uh, was a magnificent uh, expedition um, with some really amazing um, pieces of classical work um, by a lot of recognizable names. Um, last year, they had a visiting piece by uh, Vermeer, uh, a very famous uh, painter um, uh, from the later Renaissance period. Um, one of the inspirations for uh, some of the light modifying tools that we use these days uh, are soft boxes, namely, um, are modeled after or designed to render a quality of light that's modeled after something that Vermeer established hundreds of years ago. So, what I'd like to do is I want to show you. Um, a handful of uh, pieces that were hanging at the Norton Simon Museum um, two years ago. Most of them, in fact, I, th I think in this particular batch, all of these uh, in this series were um, uh, artifacts in residence, uh, meaning that the museum owned these actual pieces. Sometimes when you go to the museum, you look at pieces that are on loan from other institutions and uh, they get them for a period of time and they display them and and uh, you go and you get to see you know some some new blood in the selection and other times you you go and you see um, the pieces that traditionally hang in the uh, salons and you just go back to revisit them and get uh, re-inspired or um, you know look at them and and, and rededicate them uh, the images and their details to memory um, one of the reasons I used to like to take students to the Norton Simon Museum was because you could take photographs. As long as it was a artifact in residence at the Norton Simon, you could photograph it because they owned it and there was no um, licensing infringement for doing so. So these photographs came from the Norton Simon uh, for the uh, explicit purpose of educating students and creating awareness for some of the early uh, Flemish painters, some uh, artists from the classical period, 
uh, and some artists from the Renaissance and later um, in the 1800s um, with the emergence of Impressionism and the uh, post-Renaissance period. So I'd like to show you now a group of images, and I want you to pay particular attention. Um, keep in mind your your readings uh, this week on three-point lighting. And think about placement of our primary source of illumination, our key light, and how that creates three-dimensional rendering in a two-dimensional in a two-dimensional medium like film. Okay, and uh, bear in mind the um, the level of contrast present in each of these images, and you understand from your reading that contrast is controlled by your fill light and the possible separation or um, uh, edge detail uh, emphasized by the edge light or the backlight. Uh, and see if you can spot the instances where we have uh, that element uh, working uh, within the composition. So we're going to start off with everybody's favorite guy, Mr. Rembrandt. And it is a self-portrait. Uh, from 1636, and I believe in that year, I believe Rembrandt was about 32 years old. Um, he used to do self-portraits on a regular basis every few years. Part of the reason was to document his visage um, and the changes uh, you know, that took place in his own image. Um, but it, it was also uh, because Rembrandt was a meticulous student of the human form and how light rendered on the face and the body. And in or, you know, his most readily available subject um, was himself and a mirror and a canvas and a palette of paints. So let's start off with a look at Mr. Rembrandt from 1636. And you're going to notice a few things. This is a classic Rembrandt lighting composition. And you can see that you have the golden triangle here that is a highlight emerging on the low side of the artist's image. And, of course, his key light is providing all of this shape and highlight on the high side of the composition. And so we get a nice transition from highlight to shadow across the composition. We get a nice sense of the three-dimensionality of his face by the way the shadow plays on the low side and along his jaw, his chin, and his cheekbones. And you can see kind of how the light is kind of coming from here in this fashion, 45 degrees off axis from the camera and slightly above eye level. That's the prescription for a Rembrandt key light. And you can kind of see here how that works. Now, this particular shot uh, doesn't have a great deal of separation uh, of our subject from his background, but the background is probably taking the spill or the the light that uh, doesn't hit the subject and hits the wall behind him to illuminate the background. In some cases, if that's not enough value or exposure, we can add a light to the background to brighten it up and create even more separation between our subject and the, the background that we see behind him or her. Uh, but in this case, he just let it go, and I think it's a tasteful and sensible choice. You can see at the top of his velvet beret, that there's a little suggestion of a top light, which might be coming from a chandelier or a candle sconce on the wall behind him or above him. And that's about it. It's uh, For the most part, it's one deliberate light source, the key light, and it renders all of this shape and all of this color and all of this exposure. Uh, and I think it does it really well. Bear in mind that uh, part of the warm quality to this light is a direct 
uh, reflection of the types of light sources that these folks in 1636 were using. If you were working inside and you were working in your studio, you were probably using candlelight illumination. If you were lucky enough to have a window that faced the right portion of the sky where you could get some nice indirect north light to come through uh, with a nice white daylight color quality to it, uh, if you were lucky enough to have that kind of a studio, you might have had ample uh, ample available light to work. If not, you were using candles. And I think that that particular uh, aspect is uh, obvious in the warm tones in this particular image. Let's move on to another one of Rembrandt's early works. This is the man in the wide-brimmed hat from 1633. So it's a couple of years before the portrait we were just looking at. Um, and you can see his sense of shape on his subjects already. You can see how he prefers a, a key light that's coming almost completely from the side. It comes around just frontal enough to introduce a little bit of value on the low side of the cheek. Okay, But predominantly the shape is here. The shape of the brow is defined by his key light. The shape of the nose has been defined here by the way the key light is mapping itself on the, the face of his subject. And then, of course, the shadow on this side of the face is thinning out the subject. Um, and just a suggestion of a kiss of light on the, on the low cheekbone to illuminate the eye and give us a little bit of shape on the cheek. Uh, other than that, you can see that this brighter value on the back wall is some residual spill from the key light, which is coming from 45 degrees off axis to camera, slightly above eye level. And what doesn't hit the gentleman in the hat is going behind him and striking the wall behind him and giving us just enough illumination to see the separation that we have here. The next one we're going to look at is by Gabriel Metsu. And this is the lady in her toilette. And uh, in, in those days, the toilette was a, was a room where you uh, took care of your morning business, but you also uh, got dressed, applied your makeup, uh, answered letters, red letters uh, that had arrived. Um, and in this case, there's even the suggestion that this woman has been practicing her uh, viola. So uh, you can see here that her primary source of illumination is the open window. And so the shape of all of these characters is going to be dictated by the way the light comes through the window and strikes them on the face and their position uh, in the window. I have a close-up here at the end of the presentation that shows you a little bit more detail what's going on there and you can see that we have the same kind of shape going on that we had in the Rembrandt portraiture where we have a prevailing key that's giving us exposure and it's rendering dimension from the direction of the source and as it crosses over to the low side we get the suggestion of a golden triangle on the low cheekbone a little bit of illumination in the eye and we get this nice, pleasing shape to the face. This is classic Rembrandt lighting, inspired by this artist, Rembrandt, and copied um, ever since by his contemporaries, and then later adopted by uh, people who were lighting uh, images for still photography, and then later for film work. When we light our subjects, we aspire towards this classic Rembrandt look, which is shaped from off camera, one side or the other. Nice rendering to cheekbones, chins, noses, and eyebrows. And uh, adequate illumination to create exposure. And the suggestion of our color balance. So... Let's keep moving on here and see what we've got. Here's a Rembrandt, uh, his son Titus from 1658. And this one's a little bit more impressionistic. There's a little bit less detail going on in the actual brush stroke. And you can see that he's made a, a choice in the lighting 
for a young man. He's not given the young man the dramatic, imposing look of, say, the man in the wide-brimmed hat. He gives an older, more distinguished gentleman a more moody character to his lighting, and he leaves the young man open and bright and lively uh, with the suggestion of a flatter uh, key light coming around directly over our point of view and slightly above eye level. And we know that the placement of that light is there because of the telltale sign below the nose and below the chin. That slight suggestion of a shadow indicates that the light was very nearly directed straight at the young man from the point of view of Rembrandt uh, or our camera, if you can think about it that way and the flatness and the brightness of the lighting uh, suggests the youth, the livelihood, and the innocence of the young man. And so he is rendered thusly, as opposed to a more dramatic, suggestive lighting. Now, here's another self-portrait by Marie Bouliard from 1785. She's taking the same tactic uh, in her lighting of... Uh, her female subject, in this case herself, and you can see how she's elected to have a fuller uh, frontal key light um, with just the suggestion of a shadow on one side or the other. In this case, it's the camera right side, uh, and that's just enough of a shadow to define the line of her jawbone and her cheekbone. Okay, it's just enough shape from the side and a little higher than eye level to give a heart-shaped uh, overall facial composition. Um, this is classic female beauty lighting where the key light is either directly over camera or very nearly directly over camera and um, slightly above eye level, not so far above eye level that we don't get the little catch light in the eye, as you can see here, but far enough above eye level to start developing the shape of the cheekbones, okay? And then we have a nice gradual fall off from the forehead down to the bust, and you can see there's just a little bit of spill from the key light hitting the wall behind the subject to give us a little bit of separation. So this is another one light composition. No other lighting was used. However, we do see a level of fill on the low side jaw that indicates probably the key light bouncing off of her white dress and reflecting back up under her chin. So there's probably not an additional light going on. Um, maybe, but probably not, um, because she's fair-skinned and she's wearing white to begin with, and those uh, reflective qualities help to sort of fill in the shadows so we don't get quite as stark a rendering as we would from an individual wearing a dark garment where you don't get any reflection off of the, um, the chemise onto the face, and therefore the low side shadows are more striking. So you may elect to uh, put your female subject in a wardrobe that offer you the advantage of low contrast and slight reflectivity. Um, to uh, soften the shadows, the shaping shadows of the female face. This next shot is uh, Marie Lebron, uh, the Countess Kinsky from 1793. And again, you can see the fullness of the frontal lighting on the female. Um, it's not necessary to offer uh, a subject with feminine features the striking and dramatic contrast of lighting that you would give to a man. Generally, when we light our subjects, male and female, we will treat them differently because of the more angular features of a man and the softer, gentler curves of a woman um, dictates the style of lighting that we want to use. Here's a regional governor from France, uh, Lambert de Vermont, 1700. This is a highly detailed uh, painting. Uh, this image was taken from probably eight feet away. This is an enormous canvas. Um, and the detail is just uh, exquisite, all the way into the lace of the neckerchief that he's wearing. Uh, just fantastic. 
And in this case, he's elected to have a fuller key light as well on his subject's face. I suspect that that's because of the abundance of hair uh, going on here uh, and the fact that this gentleman was somebody of very high station and therefore um, probably not the subject of a great deal of drama. So his life was more in the spotlight. His life was more publicly uh, notable and therefore his lighting is more open and revealing. Just a kind of a suggestive quality to his lighting that speaks uh, volumes of information beyond the actual image. This next panel is from a much larger composition. Uh, this is Guido Cagnacci uh, from Italy, and this is Martha rebuking Mary. And this is actually a close-up of the critical detail in the panel. Um, there's also a caricature of, uh, of, of the pan god and the devil and uh, the dove of salvation and uh, the, the afternoon summer sky and a great deal of imagery that draws you away from the central characters of, of Martha and Mary. Uh, and I wanted to do this in close-up for a couple of really good reasons. You can see that some really significant choices were made in this particular panel, and that is that we have some very classic sort of dramatic shaping going on uh, on Martha's face, while Mary, who is apparently guilty of something, otherwise why would she be getting rebuked or uh, basically yelled at by Mary, uh, her face is in shadow. And there is a psychological implication for a face that is in shadow. A face that is well lit is enlightened, and a face that is in shadow is in mystery or unknowing or in mischief. So in this case, Martha's guilty of something. We don't know what it is, but we know that Mary caught her, and Mary's calling her out. And that's exactly what's happening in here. And we can see that because he's elected to treat uh, Martha's face in shadow, um, or I'm sorry, Mary's face in shadow, and Martha's face in the light, you can tell who's justified in their actions. Uh, Martha is in the right because she's in the light, and Mary is in the wrong because she is turned away from the light. And that also has some serious religious symbolism. Here's one of my favorites. This is Rotari from 1755, and this is the girl writing a letter. And this one I like to study for some time because there's a lot of suggestion happening here. There's an entire story going on in this painting. And it's fun to speculate about because obviously uh, unless you had any, um, any notes on the subject of this painting from the artist himself, um, you can almost decide what the story is that's going on here for yourself. Uh, and in that way, the artist is allowing you to inject some of your own um, personality into your viewing experience. But you can see that the girl is dressed in red. And what we will talk, one of the things we'll talk about in lighting too, is how the color red can symbolize a number of things. It can symbolize energy. It can symbolize passion. It can symbolize love. Um, but it's generally an emotional color. And you can see that that color is not only in her dress, but it's also in the blush of her cheek. So she's blushing a little bit. So she's passionate, and she's blushing because her look, her gaze is right at us. And we've caught her in an intimate moment. She's writing a letter. And she's probably writing a letter to someone she's romantically involved with. The, the, um, the gentleness with which she's holding the quill pen, the fact that she's wearing the red dress, the fact that she's blushing, she's turned away from the light as though concealing her thoughts or her emotions. And she's looking right at us as if we've caught her in the act of writing a love letter. And so... More than likely, those are all of the classic uh, presumptions that we can make about this image, and more than likely that was the intention from the artist uh, to the viewer, was to suggest that 
this young lady is in love and she's communicating with her suitor. This is the young man in the red beret. And uh, it's interesting because you can see we're starting to develop a sense of separation up here. The hat has clearly been lit. So this is probably a chandelier or a sconce above his head. And then, of course, he's turned away from camera or away from the point of view of the artist. And he's looking off the canvas to our left. And therefore, he has turned into his light source. If he were looking directly at us, he would have some very dramatic half-light shape going on in his face. But he has elected to turn away from us and look into his source into his light source. So you can draw the, whatever conclusions you want in, in this case, but it's interesting to point out that the quality of our lighting is dictated not only by the position of our light relative to our subject from the point of view of our camera, but the quality of that light or the suggestion of that shape or mood changes as our characters move within that light. So you want to bear that in mind in uh, future assignments as you start lighting subjects and paying attention to the direction of your light sources that interesting things will happen as your actors begin to interact with your lighting. And you have to keep that in mind, always relative to the point of view of the camera, to make sure that you are creating the correct mood uh, or shape or feeling with your lighting that the story intends. Here is a nice rendering, the man in armor from 1630. And the reason I show this uh, painting is not because it's um, particularly striking lighting. Now it is Rembrandt positioned. However, the man is turned away from his key, so he appears to be half lit. And the visor of his helmet is putting his eyes in shadow, uh, which has uh, some implication for us as to the character, the nature of the character uh, and his tendency. But more importantly than that is look how accurately and effectively the artist has rendered the highlight in the man's suit of armor and in his helmet. Uh, just fantastic um, the way... Uh, an artist from 1630 who has never had the advantage of an electric light or a camera with which to photograph a subject and observe the detail has, through purely through observation, learned what a highlight looks like that's reflected in a metal surface. And he has learned how to effectively render that image uh, as a highlight in the detail of his character's garb. I think that's really fantastic. Here is uh, Barbieri, Giorgio Barbieri, The Suicide of Cleopatra, 1621. And she's half lit. She's turned away from her key. The implication of a character that turns away from the light or rejects the light is one who has fallen from grace one who has chosen a dark path in life, one who is forsaken, one who is, um, who is depressed, lonely, sad, or hopeless. Um, this is called the suicide of Cleopatra. She's about to uh, allow herself to be bitten by the snake. This is directly from the, the legend of Cleopatra. And uh, you know that Mark Anthony and Cleopatra in legend were um, leaders uh, uh, in the uh, Roman Empire and um, lovers, forbidden lovers. Uh, Mark Anthony, um, I believe he poisons himself um, when he learns that he can't have a relationship with Cleopatra and in her uh, despair allows herself to be bitten by a poisonous adder so that she can join her lover in the afterlife. So here it is, rendered out for us to take a look at. You can see that the contrast is high. The shadow side of her face is deep and dark. She's half-lit, indicating that she is turning away from the light. 
She's wearing passionate red robes. She was in love with this man, and this man is dead, and she is willing to commit suicide so that she can be with him. And you can see the, the little snakes that are coming out of the wicker basket. Pretty dramatic stuff. So if these guys in 1621 and 1630 and 1638 are all rendering their lighting uh, with all of this intention, then we want to be making the same sorts of assessments and conclusions in our lighting for video. Because everything that we do with our lighting has everything to do with the mood that our viewer is going to pick up on or derive from watching our material. So we want to be careful about how we light our subjects so that we offer the correct, uh, uh, the correct visual information to our viewers. We wouldn't want uh, the suicide of Cleopatra to be lit like the portrait of Rembrandt's son Titus, where she would be broadly and brightly lit. That wouldn't insinuate that she was in any sort of desperation or remorse. Uh, it would it would produce quite the opposite reaction in our viewer. So when we use the right style of lighting on our subject, we start to imply the right types of moods, and we communicate non-verbally with our viewers the intent of our content of our of our films. This is a great one. This panel uh, by Matthias Stomer is called "The Mocking of Christ," and I always show this to my students when I'm ready to have a discussion about the light meter. And it's a little early in lighting one to talk about light meters with you folks, but uh, eventually you're going to be introduced to a tool that will allow you to measure the output of your lighting instruments and effectively set the camera so that your exposures are adequate uh, and bright and not muddy and dark and underexposed. Um, the fact that these characters are all lit from one single light source, and they're all lit by a candle. That's a 12-inch taper. And by definition, um, a foot candle is a unit of measurement that a light meter uses to determine the intensity of the output of a lighting fixture. And a, a foot candle is defined as the output of one 12-inch uh, tapered candle uh, that has been lit and the amount or the volume of illumination in one cubic foot of space. So a foot candle is the demonstration that you're seeing before you in the mocking of Christ. There's a little bit more than a square foot between the gentlemen that are there, but the intention is the same. And you can see how the small candle flame has a contrasty uh, directional quality to it. There's a, there's a hard shadow that's being struck across the chin of the, the man behind Christ. The gentleman holding the candle is fully frontly lit because the candle's right in front of him. And the same with the Christ. He's fully frontly lit and the light falls off to the back because he's turned away from us and turned into the light. You see how the insinuation there of the holy figure who is being scorned and is being uh, ultimately put to death and he is looking into the illumination. He's looking into the light for his knowledge and his salvation. And all of these men are looking at him, looking into the light. And they are all realizing his intensity. They're realizing his message. Whatever you want to derive from this, if you're a if you are a religious person, this image will have a great deal of significance to you, and you'll be able to discern all of the intention the artist had by using this particular light source in this particular way to light up all these folks. See how these great shadows, everybody's turned away from the point of view of our camera, and they're looking across the canvas at one another, and they're all so brilliantly shaped and lit. It's so three-dimensional. It's really great. I love this shot. This is The Geographer by Caravaggio. And this is a really contrasty shot, um, but you can see how he was really into hard shadows and a lot of contrast in his subjects. He's also using contrasted colors. The red 
of his blouse and the green of his overcoat are chromatic opposites. And he's lit uh, harshly and directly. It's striking him right on the forehead from a Rembrandt position. You can see the triangle on his low, his low side cheekbone and the striking shadow from his jawline, his chin, and his cheekbone. And, of course, very little separation between him and his background. That is typical Caravaggio. And Caravaggio, his images and his paintings were as striking and contestable as his lifestyle. Caravaggio is an interesting character. He was a, a rogue. He was actually wanted for murder at one point in his career. And in his day and age, in the 1600s, uh, it was possible for a man to travel all through Europe while he was wanted by the law and possibly avoid being captured if he had enough money and he had enough resources to continually stay on the move. And that's exactly what Caravaggio did. He went from town to town, living until he felt like he was about to be discovered, and then he would move again. And he would linger just long enough in certain places to, to produce paintings for uh, folks that would uh, commission him to do so. And he made his living creating paintings and living his life on the run, drinking and debauching, and at some point uh, committing murder. So Caravaggio was a pretty, <laughs> pretty colorful character all in his own. Here is St. Cecilia. Very moody. She's looking upward as, uh, as if to insinuate that she is appealing to God. She's playing the violin, um, albeit in a very strange posture, but she's playing the violin. And she is making an emotional appeal to God for something, perhaps making a wish or uh, seeking inspiration or guidance. Um, and you can see how dramatically she's lit. Um, again, she's wearing a red garment, so she's passionate, and she is thought-provoking. This is a neat shot here. This is St. Francis in prayer. And the only thing that I would call to your attention here is, is how the garments are rendered and the shadows resulting from the hood and the cuffs and the sleeves and how accurately these guys are rendering these characters uh, without the aid of a camera or photographic device or even an electric light that they can rely on. These folks were really paying attention to what they were doing. I want to zoom through a couple of these panels. Here we go. Here's an interesting one here. This is Renoir. Now, Renoir is in the later period, after, well after the Renaissance, in the mid to late 1800s. And this was during the um, Impressionist period in France. Um, and Impressionism is basically the notion that you can paint just enough detail in an image to give all of the information and suggestion that the viewer needs to mentally insert what details are absent from the painting with their own imagination. And so even though the woman in the black hat is not clearly defined with enough detail to you know, show us the individual hairs or the petals in the carnation on her hat or the, uh, the, the details of the brooch around her neck, and yet we still understand what this is. It's as, this, it's as though this image was shot with a camera through a Vaseline filter or a, a diffusion filter, um, rendering all the details soft and diffused, uh, and yet still giving us enough detail to where we can see uh, and appreciate her beauty, and we get a sense of her innocence by the, by the full frontal illumination from her key light. And um, she's wearing a dark garment and darker hair, so we don't get that much separation from the background. So what is left is the hierarchy of her physical uh, shape of her face against the darker background, and it isolates that detail for us so that we are compelled only to view her face and not to be 
distracted or concerned with any of the details that do not relate to her image of her face. So the use of highlight and shadow here is to create a focal point, uh, and that focal point is the beautiful young woman. So clearly the artist was uh, enamored with her. Toulouse-Lautrec and Degas, a couple of interesting characters. Both could render shape and texture so well with charcoal. Um, this is from a series of uh, charcoal sketches uh, by Degas, dancers uh, at the Barre Theater. And um, even in black and white, even with charcoal, uh, he's figured out a way to show us highlight. He's figured out a way to render shadow. And he's also envisioning um, a classic Rembrandt style illumination on the face of his dancer. And she's turned into the light and profiled the camera. And in doing so, her key light that comes from off to the side and her backlight or edge light is shaping her neck and her collarbone and the, uh, the top of her bust. All of that in a charcoal sketch. Here's another one um, by Degas and it's the woman combing her hair. And again, even with the crude um, rudimentary charcoal uh, pastel uh, crayon, he is giving us all of these wonderful shapes and shadows and curves and textures um, in an impressionistic way, um, ever mindful of the quality of light that's hitting his subject, how it's hitting the subject, from what direction and what color it is. No tour of a traditional art gallery with classical paintings would be complete without a look at Van Gogh. This is the peasant and Picasso. And this is the woman with a book. And it's pretty cool. I like to show folks the Picasso only because, and Van Gogh has a sense of this as well, the colors that these guys chose to use when rendering shadow area. You can see that Van Gogh is using blues and reds in the shadows uh, under the brim, under the jaw, around the neck, and even the whites of the peasant's eyes are not really white. You can see that they're green, purple, and red. And over here, in the shadow on the woman with a book, Picasso is using green and purple as his defining colors in the shadow areas of the face. You can see how the neck, and she's clearly side lit, and her neck and her face are side lit, and you can see that the highlight is white and definable, and the shadow areas are green and purple. Interesting choices. Um, it makes you wonder sometimes uh, what these folks were thinking about. Here again is the uh, close-up of the woman in her toilette uh, by Metsu. And again, that's the quality of the Rembrandt lighting as rendered by window light. So that's a, that's a little tour of the, uh, the Renaissance and post-Renaissance wing of the Norton Simon Museum. I hope you enjoyed this virtual tour. And I hope that this has in some way, um, given you some things to think about uh, as you uh, begin to approach your lighting later in the month. Uh, there's going to be some exercises uh, where you're going to have to um, demonstrate a little bit of your three-point lighting as you read about it in your textbooks and you uh, watch or learn on your video tutorials. Um, when you are practicing your lighting, be thinking about some of these examples. and. Um, I also encourage you to go online and start seeking out um, some of these images for yourself and finding more. There's so many to choose from. Uh, there's such an amazing array of classical art that is available for us to uh, see and enjoy. So that's it. That's my discussion for this evening. Um, I hope you enjoyed a 
a brief look at classical art and our study of the three-point lighting inspiration from which our style has evolved. Okay, I will see you around the LMS. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, if you have any questions, as always, feel free to email me. Uh, call my office phone. Leave me a message. I will call you back. And good luck on your assignments uh, for this week. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.